What's going on, guys? Charles Warren, AKA the Handsome Home Buyer. If you haven't yet joined my text platform, please do. Number is right there. We're doing a ton of one on one engagement. People are asking me whatever they want, dropping all my best secrets, putting out exclusive info just for the text platform. So definitely check it out. It's free and it's a lot of fun. Today, we're going to be talking about everything you need to know about oil tanks on a residential and commercial level. So I've been getting a lot of inquiries lately from realtors both on the commercial and the residential side in regards to oil tanks, environmentals, and things of that nature. So I thought I'd put together a video that discusses residential and commercial and what to know if you're on the buying side, the selling side, if you're an agent or you're an investor. So let's for a minute talk about residential for a second, okay? On Long Island and I'm sure across the country, there's a lot of places where they had in-ground oil tanks. So they had these 200, your basic 275 gallon oil tank, popped in the ground, put there back in the 60s, and um, the house was built, you get your typical 1,000 square foot house, 1,500 square foot house. Now, is there cause for concern for that? Is there not? You know, what are the ins and outs and what to worry about? So, essentially it's not really a big deal, okay? So you have an in-ground oil tank. If you have an active in-ground oil tank that's being used, there's a bunch of different ways to take care of it. It's relatively quick, it's relatively inexpensive, and it's relatively simple. If you're on Long Island, you're in, let's say Nassau County, what you're gonna do is you're gonna abandon the tank or hire a company to come in. What they're gonna do is they're gonna suck all the oil out and then they can deal with it a number of different ways, obviously at different price points, depending on what's legal in that area and what you're looking to do. Obviously the best way is to actually remove the tank, take it out, fill it in and be done. What they also do is they'll, they'll dig down, they'll cut the top of the tank off, they'll fill it with sand or the cheapest way, that's kind of like the middle. Most expensive is to take it out, the sand is the middle, and the cheapest way is in certain areas where you're allowed, you're not really allowed in flood zones area close to water, but you'll suck it out, and what they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll put a hose in and they'll foam up the entire tank. And then what they do is they file something with the health department in Nassau County, it's the Nassau County Health Department. There is no inspection or anything like that. The, uh, the company that actually is doing the abandonment, they're the ones that are responsible for that, you get a certificate, everything is great, you're done. So that's, and if you're gonna be putting in a new oil tank that's above ground or something like that, obviously you need a permit and a plumbing permit to follow. But that's how you address something like that. If there was once an abandoned, if there was once an oil tank there and there's no record, the health department are the people that ultimately have the records. If they don't have a record for it, it could have been abandoned, but not legally, or it wasn't done obviously through the health department getting, getting a permit. Now, what do you need to know about these things if you're an investor, if you're a homeowner, if you're buying, if you're selling? Again, usually not that big of a deal, but environmental issues are a really big deal. They're really expensive, they take a while to deal with, you have to deal with the DEC and things of that nature, and these cleanups can cost tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the extent. So if you're a seller or if you're a realtor that's representing a seller and a buyer comes in and says that they would like to test the ground or anything like that, absolutely no. Because once something is found, that's it. It sticks with the property forever. And there's different levels of environmental which we'll go over in the commercial section because it's more applicable in commercial development. But if you are a seller, Never, never, never under any circumstances, even if you have to tell the buyer to walk, allow somebody to test the ground to see if there's any kind of contaminants around the oil tank. Because if it comes up, they're gonna walk away, you can have a huge bill and a nightmare, and that's gonna be branded on the property, essentially, for life, and you're gonna scare away people that don't understand you know, the severity or, or lack of severity of that, okay? If you are a, uh, an agent that's representing a buyer, you know, just understand that the process is it gets abandoned properly, one of those three ways. The health department supplies a certificate saying it was done the right way, and that's it. Just as long as you have the certificate, you're covered, they're covered, it's all good to go. It was very, very common years ago for people to bear oil tanks. Now, when you get into the commercial world, it's a very, very, very different thing. In residential contracts, you don't usually have subject to environmental because environmentals aren't usually a big deal. In commercial, environmentals are a very big deal and can get very, very expensive. I've been involved in a number of commercial deals where the cleanup is 
hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on the severity. And this could come from people dumping, it could come from tanks in the ground, it could come from any number of different things. Neighboring properties where things just kind of drifted over from rain or whatnot over the years. It really, really depends, so you have to be careful. So typically a contract on a commercial property is done subject to environmental. So you would have this three different environmentals that go along depending on the issues that you do or do not have and, and how far you get there. So the first one is a phase one, okay? And a phase one is very common, very minor, and very inexpensive. It's usually about $1,500 and essentially a report. What they're doing is they're looking up and they're saying, all right, what's the history of this property? What's the history of the properties that are adjacent to it? What went on there? Were there any tanks that were recorded to be buried? Like, what went on? And based on that and an inspection of the site, they will decide, the environmental company will decide, hey, do we have to take this a step further to a phase two or is this good? Also, if you're applying for a loan, is the bank gonna say, you know what, we're cool with this phase one, we don't need a phase two, or does this require a little more exploration, a little more research, a little more due diligence, and you go into a phase two. So, like I said, a phase one is $1,500. Let's say that they see something that they don't like. Right, there was a tent, there's a tank buried next door. There's like pictures or something showing like they might have been dumping or whatever. Then you go into a phase two environmental. A phase two environmental is when they come in and they do actually do borings and samples of the ground itself in different parts, and they even go down and sample the groundwater to see if that's contaminated. And that can really range anywhere from depending on how big the site is and how many samples. You're looking at $5,000 and up, and it could be eight, 10, 12, 20, $30,000, depending on how extensive it is. They go over the ground to see if they can find any tanks with this machine, I forgot what it's called, but you get the idea. And um, then those samples come back from the lab, and at that point, they say, you know, what do we have, how significant it is, does it need to be cleaned up? If they do the samples and they do find contaminants, the contaminants have to be dealt with properly. In order to deal with the contaminants properly, that's where you actually go into the cleanup phase or the phase three, which has the potential to be minimal or an insane amount of money. You obviously also have to get the DEC involved. You have to file permits for this. You have to clean it up properly. They have to inspect it. If you have soil that has contaminants in it, it needs to be disposed of properly, which is very, very expensive. There's also um, methods for this. So if you have a commercial property that has a significant cleanup, you may or may not be eligible for something called the Browns Field Cleanup Program. All right? The Browns Field Cleanup Program is essentially a government subsidized program that essentially gives you grants and tax credits and things of that nature to help you abate major, major properties. So it's, you need to have an expert kind of bring you through the process. It's a little bit cumbersome. It's a little bit long. On smaller projects, it isn't necessarily worth it because there is a decent fee to do that. You have to have an accountant that's an expert. You have to have an environmental expert. You need to have an attorney who's an expert in structuring this. So by the time you're done paying these fees, and, and you know, it doesn't matter, the paperwork is the paperwork. It doesn't matter if it's a $50,000 cleanup or a $3 million cleanup. The time is the time and the cost is the cost. So on smaller cleanups, it doesn't usually make sense. On larger cleanups, uh, it can make sense and you can really, really, you know, save a lot of money that way. So um, that's pretty much just make sure when you have any type of commercial contract that it's subject to the environmental. Make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you have a clause that can allow you to get out of it if the person that has the property isn't willing to clean that up, all right? So again, I appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much. We love topics for new videos, so comment, like, subscribe, let us know in the comments if you liked the video, timestamp the parts of the video that you did like, and give us ideas for things that you'd like to learn about in the future. Thank you, we'll see you on next week's educational vlog.